Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Talking Wellness with Webster Rec and Wellness 360. Thank you so much for joining us today. We got a great topic called intermittent fasting. So anyone that's interested in learning about intermittent fasting, this is the talk for you. So we have me, Beth Perry from Wellness 360, and say hello, Jay. Hello, everybody. Good to be back. All right, we got... Jay from the Webster Rec Center with us today. Today we have a very special guest. She's not only a friend of mine, she is an expert in her field of nutrition. So I'm going to introduce Tina Durham to you and I will let her kind of start out by telling you just a little bit about herself. Welcome okay. Tina. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Tina. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Ohio. I was a, a United States Marine. Um, I got out of the Marine Corps and uh, I just kind of floated around for a while. didn't really know where I belonged or what was good for me. Um, and then I kind of started um, falling into physical fitness. Like I, I, I fell into a workout regimen and, and a routine um, and that followed me for quite some time. I ended up being a fitness instructor for a little while. Um, and then there was this one day that I'll never forget that I can still, you know, remember, like, if my, like, why am I not losing weight? Like, why are my students not losing weight? I, they show up every two weeks. Why don't we all look ripped right now? I'm a fitness instructor. Like what's, what's going on? Um, and I ended up, you know, kind of just doing a little bit of research into nutrition and how our body process is different, um, you know, your macronutrients and micronutrients. And I, I got like really into it. Like I couldn't stop reading things. I couldn't stop getting, um, you know, reading research and stuff like that. And that's how I knew like, that's where I belong. I finally kind of fell on it. Like that's, that's the missing piece that I think everyone kind of has, you know, they, they go to the gym and wh why don't I get the results? And I'm killing myself at the gym. I'm doing two hours and doing this. And I, I just don't get it. And there's just so much misinformation out there. And so I was on a mission to find like the truth. Um, so I got my master's degree in nutrition. I have uh, three little kids. So I'm very busy. Uh, I'm, I do nutritional consultations from home, like via FaceTime. And I'm a, I'm a health and fitness coach. And I, you know, kind of help, I, my specialty really is women, but I've had, I have worked with men before, but my specialty is really like just helping women understand what food does in their body, how it affects their hormones um, and how to get the best results kind of the, that they're looking for so that they can reach that place of peace, you know, with their body instead of running that, that war with themselves and, you know, always wanting to be this or that, or look this way or whatever. I really try to switch, help them switch their mindset to nutrition and health and wellness as opposed to like how do I lose 20 pounds <laughs> that kind of that kind of thing because I was in that diet reel for a long time when I, was, when I was in my teens so that really has called me to um, do nutrition and spread kind of the truth instead of all the fads and those kinds of things. So I couldn't agree with you more Tina that is awesome and again she's a very dear friend of mine so she's my go-to whenever I have a question about nutrition or what's going on with this or that, because um, I kind of started with the same background. That's why we get along so well. We're both really into fitness. And me, with one of being one of the owners of Wellness 360, and Jay, I'd like for you to chime in on this also. But I tell people, fitness is amazing. And I cannot speak high enough about fitness. And, and like Jay and I talked, the vanilla of fitness, the, the getting the foundational movements down before we you go jumping into the, to do a big program, and working with wellness 360, we do a lot of modifications, but when it comes to nutrition, that has to be, that's probably the demon in my pocket is nutrition. I'm not great with nutrition and I will be the first one to admit it. I know this much, but for me myself, I refer to the experts. So I'm the one that you come to, you're saying, Hey, I'm having these issues, whether it be with a diagnosis, because we all know things change when you have a diagnosis or whether it be with a digestive issue or weight loss, I'm the, the first one to say, you know what, here's Tina's information, talk to her, because there's so much that I don't know, and so much more ways that you can help than I can in this area. Jay, what do you typically do when it comes to nutrition? Um, 
you know, it's, it's always been an area of interest myself. I've, um, I've taken some um, coaching or uh, nutrition coaching classes. Um, it's a lot of the stuff that I've learned has been either, you know, doing research myself. I've also known a couple of nutritionists myself that I, I tend to run things by as well, because I don't, I'm certainly not a nutritionist and I'm not going to go outside of my scope of practice. But one of the things that I will say is um, regardless of what your goals are or, or, or your reason to exercise, because they're all good. But if, if you're not fueling yourself properly and you know, Beth, you and I talk about this all the time, the whole recovery aspect of things and nutrition can be a big part of that recovery. A lot of what you're doing in the gym, in your classes, may well fall short. So to me, I mean, I don't know if, if it's if it's one is necessarily more important than the other, but we've talked about before, if there's a period, a uh, pyramid, I would say the bottom would be, you know, sleep, stress management. The next tier up would probably be nutrition and then exercise would be the next on the list. So I talk to a lot of people being in this field. Um, it's like, Jay, I, I have these aesthetic goals, but I am not achieving them. I'm working so hard. A lot of times it's they're working too hard and they're not paying attention to what they're putting in their body. So um, it's it's definitely something that, that that's out there. Um, let's face it, people like to, uh, a lot of people like to exercise so they can eat what they want and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But if you do have loftier body composition goals, it's probably going to be a lot harder if you have uh, that philosophy. Absolutely. I could not agree more with you. Um, and I used to be that person. I was a personal trainer and I used to work out so I could eat. Thank goodness that was, you know, in my <laughs> mid 20s. <laughs> and things have, have changed slightly. Um, I do know that Tina has corrected me on quite a few things in my own lifestyle in the most loving way possible. But yes, yeah, so I still have a lot of work to do. I am 100% better than I was. 10 to 15 years ago, but I'm excited to hear what um, I was telling Jay about intermittent fasting. And what I know about intermittent fasting is what I've read in my books of self-healing books and things of that nature and what my husband does. So I kind of just jumped ship with him. And um, so I'm really excited to hear more about the intermittent fasting. So you kind of talked a little bit about, you know, why you dove into nutrition and you're welcome to add more into that um, but I'd like to know a little bit more about, or I should say the listeners, a little more about your personal philosophy on health, wellness, fitness, um, and nutrition. So if you have, you know, a goal in mind, I usually, when I get people on the phone, I say, all right, what's your goal? And they say, I want, I want to lose 20 pounds. I want to lose 10. I want to be 160 and I'm 175. And I stop them right there. And I say, are you attached to the number or are you attached to a feeling? Do you feel better in your clothes when you're 160? Do you like, can you, do you like, what is it? What's the thing? What's the real thing? Because you've got to unhook from the scale and remember that that doesn't tell you really anything. It only tells you one biometric measurement. And if you're just starting to work out, you're going to gain weight because you retain water. Um, and so I, I ask him right off the bat, like, what's your real goal? It's a feeling. It's the feeling of confidence and self-esteem and stuff like that. And so um, you should be setting yourself up for success by making goals, things that you can control. Like I can control if I can, if, if, you know, uh, last week I did a 30 second plank that I can go for 45. I have 100% control in that area. You don't control um, the weight. So my, like kind of my uh, <laughs> overwhelming general statement is that Health is multifaceted. Get off the scale. Stop eating stuff in boxes. And um, oh, I had one more, and I just lost my, I just lost my train of thought. Um, but but yeah, so I, it's kind of it's all encompassing. And so intermittent fasting is is one of those things where it doesn't have to be the first piece or the magic piece, um, and it's definitely not the only piece. Like you can't eat garbage just. In, in an eight hour window and think that that's, that's fine. Um, I mean, I want people to eat whole foods, real foods, the way it's designed and, and stay away from the, um, like the marketing gimmicks in grocery stores because they're all trying to sell you something. Everyone's making money if they've got 
you know, a, a product on the shelf, right? So you have to be an informed consumer about what you're actually putting um, in your body. So I guess I have a couple of philosophy. <laughs> I've got a couple of good one liners that really kind of uh, encompass. I just, I just want people to be educated. Like if you're going to eat cake, eat cake, but it's not because, you know, like you don't, you don't skip out on a whole cake, you know, at night because um, you're not allowed to, you're allowed to eat whatever you want. You skip out on the junk food because it makes you feel like garbage the next day or it makes you not able to perform as well in your workouts or feel like you're dragging, you know, you, you should eat the way you want to feel. So food is fuel, not entertainment. It's used for some entertainment purposes when you're getting to social gatherings, but like on the regular day to day food is fuel. And if you can just build a good foundation where you treat food as fuel six days a week, five days a week, the other two days a week where you go out with your friends or, I mean, we don't do any of that with Corona, but you know, it, it, you order pizza or something like that, that won't make the difference. And people always get very like honed in on the, Oh, I had pizza. So I'm bad. No, you're not. No, you're not. Just get up the next day and go back to eating food that makes you feel good. That, you know, keeps you from, you know, getting diseases or, or um, keeps you from doing the things that you love and keeping up with your family and doing a workout and stuff like that, you know, fuel for, for what you want to be and who you want to be. And instead of worrying so much about the scale, maybe just um, tighten up how you're eating a little bit more. That's what really did it for me. And um, Jay, you can chime in here at any time too. But what really did it for me is when I adopted the food, food for fuel moto, kind of like, when I start to eat it, I'm like, okay, when I eat this, what is it doing to my body? Is this going to fuel me for what I want to do? Because I'm a go-getter. I want to go, go, go. I want to work out. I want to work with my patients. I want to feel good. I want to move. And so when I go to put something in my mouth, because I'm in a hurry and I didn't plan, because planning, let's get down to the basics. It's the planning. So when I get in a hurry and I go to you know a grocery store, I was telling Tina the other day, I said, I went into a convenience store because I forgot to pack my lunch or I packed it and I forgot to bring it, which is pretty typical for me. And I went to grab my normal bag of popcorn and I thought, I have a really busy day today. And I ended up buying an orange and a banana from the convenience store. And I started laughing. I thought, I, you know, you're an adult when you're buying the food and the, you know, the banana from the gas station, you know? So oh, I just... Gross. <laughs> but it was just that whole that whole mindset of food for fuel as opposed to food for, you know, just to get your hunger underway or just to shove something in your face because you know you're going to have a busy day. Like to rethink the whole idea of eating was a huge change in my in my world. And well, it's all about being intentional, which is leads us right into intermittent fasting. It's just being aware of what you're doing. I mean. Nobody, I'm a financial counselor too. So nobody goes broke on purpose. They all do it on accident. Nobody gets overweight on purpose. It's all on accident. It's all little choices you make every day that you don't think about. So intermittent fasting makes you think about when you're eating and what you're eating. Uh, I mean, not so much what I, I usually like to, um, you know, put emphasis on the what, but you know, intermittent fasting just gets you to pay attention a little bit more. So if you can just pay attention to your behaviors, a lot of the things that we've learned that are surrounding food is that what we've been taught as children. And if you think about the generation that you grew up in, you have to look around and see like, well, what was going on? You know, uh, it was things that were coming out in, in the seventies was like the quick, easy things. Fast food was just coming up. McDonald's was just getting really big. Um, quick, convenient things, uh, you know, in, in the depression, if you're, if you're one of those babies, it was all about what's quick and cheap and can go around, can go a long way. So you eat a lot of dairy and you eat a lot of grains. And then as time has gone on and the one parent has gone, you know, was at work and one parent was home to cook. And then now it's two parents being at home. It was like TV dinners and, you know, stuff in cans. And if you're, parents were on food stamps. It was like garbage food. So like you learned how to eat from your parents and it's not good or bad, but if you want to take control of your health, 
then you have to teach yourself something different than what you were taught as, as a child. And like nutrition is an opinion, like 100% hands down nutrition is an opinion. If you talk to a different nutritionist, they're going to have a different philosophy on dairy or grains. If you talk to a dietitian, they almost always back dairy, but a lot of nutrition say like, mm, no. Um, so you kind of have to decide what works for you. Some people it's beneficial. Some people it's not. Some people that have gluten intolerances, well then I usually tell them to take away almost all grains because their GI system doesn't do very well with wheat. So it probably doesn't do very well with quinoa and brown rice. Um, but for someone else, that would be great for them. If I have somebody who doesn't eat meat, but she's okay with getting, you know, her protein sources from yogurt, then it's worth it to keep yogurt in her diet. But for someone else who struggles with black, uh, bloating, gas, constipation, I take diet, I take dairy right out. So nutrition is an opinion and it needs to be specified for each person um, and their situation. I think that's a, a really great point in pretty much everything that we do is that um, there's not a one size fits all for any of this. It's very much an individualized thing. And I tend to be a self experimenter. I, I mean, I've been around long enough now where I've tried enough things. I know what makes me feel good. I know what helps me feel strong. Um, so, you know, and I enjoy that part of it, but not a lot of people necessarily do or have a lot of education and okay, what should I be eating if what I'm doing now isn't working for me? And obviously that's kind of where you come in. Um, so maybe, you know, we've been, we've been uh, throwing this word fasting and intermittent fasting uh, around uh, the last few minutes. So maybe we could talk about it. Maybe you can uh, kind of give us a definition of, uh, of intermittent fasting. Sure. So um, intermittent fasting is just an eating pattern uh, where you cycle in between eating and not eating. Um, it's, it was really popular about five years ago, and there wasn't a ton of research behind it, but now there is. Um, so a couple of years ago, it was considered a fad um, because that a fad diet is anything that just doesn't have research behind it. So um, Atkins was a fad in the 90s, low calorie, low fat, you know, those were fads in the 90s. Um, and then, you know, we went into paleo and the carnivore diet and all these other, and they're all fads when they first come out. And then we have time to do research on them and we find like what's actually effective or we do animal studies or, um, you know, human studies and we find how your body actually responds to these type of manipulations. Um, so intermittent fasting is not that you change your calories. You don't change your calorie intake uh, at all. I have people start with their BMR, which is your basal metabolic rate. Um, and this is just, if you don't have any clue how to eat, I help you figure out your BMR, which is very easy. You can Google BMR calculator and it'll tell you, and it gives you a bottom number. That's your snapshot in time of what your body needs. So let's say, for example, um, Beth, your BMR is 1,600 calories. Your body's like a save, like a bank account. So you have a checking account, and you have a savings account. If you think about it like money, if it costs you 1,600 calories to just sit on the couch and do nothing and beat your heart and blink your eyes and breathe, you know, then that's what it costs your bills. And if you're only bringing in a thousand dollars to pay your 1,600 dollars worth of bills then your body always has to borrow from its fat storages. When it's always in that state of borrowing, then you can't lose weight. Because if you can't pay your bills, are you gonna get rid of your savings account ever? No, like you're, you're gonna keep that because you need that. And so that's how your body views its fat storages. If you're always in starvation mode, if you're only eating 1200 calories and it costs you 1600, like that's not even counting exercise or, or being, you know, not being like a construction worker or anything. It doesn't count any of that. Um, being a breastfeeding mom. I mean, those all need extra calories uh, and, and energy for your body to run. So if you're always in starvation, that's when you can't lose weight. But the trick is to manipulate when you're in a fasted state, when you're in a, a level of ketosis. So your, your body will switch. Um, so, I mean, like to just to touch on keto a little bit, because I know that that's a big trend right now and a big fad that goes into when you're always in a starvation mode, like that's always in starvation and that's always in um, super, super, super low carb. So again, 
I usually only suggest keto for people that um, have a, like a nerve damage, some kind of a nerve uh, issue disease because it's very reactive with glucose. Um, so Parkinson's, um, uh, any, it, like any neuropathy that those kinds of things is what I usually suggest keto for, but, but not never as low as the fad diet suggests. Um, but, but anyway, so you want to control your starvation, quote unquote, um, and you have 16 hours uh, to fast and eight hours to eat. So you just pick a window. There's no magic, uh, time frame. There's no like, well, every, you know, you're supposed to eat 12 to eight. Well, no, you can eat 10 30 to 6 30. You can eat 10 to six, you, whatever fits for your life. It's just an eight hour of eating and a, and a 16 hour window of off. And so then your body goes from, if it's a, like an assembly line, you know, for example, and you're always bringing food in, then your blood sugar is always, you know, moving up and down, up and down. And your GI tract is always moving. It's always going, you're always pushing things along you don't really give your body a lot of time, you know, to absorb nutrients or to bring your blood sugar levels back to a normal state. Um, and so people that do intermittent fasting find that their digestion is a lot better. Like, I mean, a lot better. A lot of digestion issues seem to go away when we stop eating constantly. Because in America, we live to eat. We don't eat to live. You know, that's just not, it's just not who we are. Uh, we absolutely live to eat all around the clock. And then on top of that, we've got commercials and, and, you know, grocery stores telling us, you know, you, here's a snack. Here's a great snack for you. Snacks on snacks on snacks and don't skip breakfast. Thank you, McDonald's for letting us know that we shouldn't skip breakfast. I wonder who that benefits in, in any way, shape or form. You can skip whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want, but it's in that eight hour window so that your body goes from glucose burning, constant sugar, to fat burning. So it'll start, you know, uh, going off of ketones instead of glucose. But you absolutely need some glucose in your life, in your day. Um, all my keto people, listen, don't be mad, but you need a little bit of sugar to keep things moving along. But absolutely, um, you can go over to fat burning. Uh, mode at some point in time. So that's the intermittent fasting model that I think benefits people the most, the 16 to eight. There's another one that's eat, stop, eat, where you, you fast for 24 hours. And then that's just once or twice a week. You just don't eat from dinner on day one to dinner at day two. Um, and I don't love that one, honestly. Um, I think a lot of people Well, okay, so uh, I think a lot of people would struggle with that because if they don't eat for 24 hours, when they finally do get to eat, they're shoveling food in their mouth. You know, they, it's just like, give me everything because I'm so hungry. Um, and they end up eating things that aren't really good for them anyways. And so your body's going to store all those calories that it just was deprived of. And so then what benefit did it do? I think people do stuff like that just to shake things up because they don't know what else to do. So they're like, well, maybe if I just like boost my metabolism really quick, well, that's not true. What boosts your metabolism is eating a consistent diet of, of all foods. Um, I, I'll never tell you to like remove an entire food group uh, unless there's a contraindication, you know, for it, if you have a disease or something like that. But if you can eat food the way that it comes off of a plant consistently, your body starts to trust you and, and it'll let go of fat storages if it knows that you're going to bring in the energy that it requires. I think that's great. And uh, I know you touched a little bit about it uh, already, but maybe talking a little bit more because um, I know just from stuff that I've, I've read and, and researched, um, people that do um, long fasts that are three, five, seven days. What are your thoughts on those type of fasts or even longer too? And even for more medical purposes, like uh, diabetics, things like that. So maybe we talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't, okay. Again, like I said, nutrition's an opinion and you're the best person that's going to be able to see what makes your body feel good. If, if you feel good doing a, a day off from eating, a day, you know, maybe you really struggle with gastrointestinal issues and you're like, I just need a break. 
then you know what feels good for your body. Medically, you know, I would say not, you know, no for doing any, any longer, um, amounts of fasting, but I'm not you and I'm not your body. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what feels great. Um, the, the contraindications for fasting, like who shouldn't do fasting is anyone that needs calories on a very consistent basis. So people that are still growing, uh, people under the age of 18 are still growing and changing and stuff like that. So no, they definitely shouldn't be doing, um, intermittent fasting, breastfeeding moms, um, pregnant moms, um, diabetics are okay, but again, it needs to be personalized. It needs to be by each person. Some people, their blood sugar takes, it tanks in the morning and they have to eat right away. And so then that would throw them into, you know, into, uh, where they've got to be adding insulin, you know, that kind of thing. So it depends on the type of diabetes and it depends on the person. It's all individualized. So some Diabetics do great with intermittent fasting and some do not. You know, the other thing too that, um, that you know, kind of comes into play here too, and um, I know there's a lot of religions that have long fasting periods. Um, and if you look at some of the, the research and a lot of it, I mean, when we're talking about any outcomes here, um, it's not necessarily just one thing. So we're talking about nutrition in this case, but if you look at lifestyles in general, environment, stress, things like that. Um, but do you think, you know, for, I think, you know, certain religions that have to fast from certain periods of time, um, that that's potentially an issue, or again, is it more of an individualized thing? I mean, I think it's individualized because if you have a person uh, that's for religious reasons is, is fasting and they're anemic, that can be a very big problem, you know? Um, so then it's, it's not recommended that that person participates in that type of fasting or, you know, if they, yeah, <laughs> there, there's, it all, it just all depends. Like, cause we all have a different deck of hand, you know, a different um, hand of cards and we can't all do the same thing all the time. There are things that just don't do well with one person's body that, that can with another. So I would say if you have any medical contraindications that would say that you shouldn't be fasting or being without food for a period of time, then don't. But with that being said, our bodies aren't completely, um, you know, stranger to fasting. I mean, if, if you look at our ancestors, they, they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have a way to preserve food and, and keep it fresh. It, food was not always readily available. So sometimes fasts were necessary. Um, but to do it for, to manipulate for like weight loss reasons, it's really not necessary. I think if you can just change your mindset to being more like food is energy, eat real food and pay attention to how your body responds, you don't need to do those, do those long um, fasts. I think people just want that quick fix. And so if they just starve themselves, then, you know, they'll lose the 10 pounds or the water weight or whatever. But as soon as they start eating again, it, it all comes back. And then right. some. And think that, oh, I'm sorry, Beth. I was just no, going to say that. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say that, um, you know, for people that do try intermittent fasting, um, worst case scenario, if you start feeling poorly or you're not feeling good, you just start eating. Again. So it's yeah. one of those things that, you know, give it a, give it a shot. Um, worst case scenario, you eat some food. Yeah. I, I have right. a question for you, yeah. Tina. Um, I saw a Facebook ad once and it, it, it struck me intriguing and I started to read it, but I wasn't going to pay to get the information. <laughs> because I have you. Why would I need to pay somebody else for the information? Right. Right. So they, they've talked about body types and different types oh, yeah. of fasting that one person should be fasting longer. Do you find any validity to that? No. <laughs> no. I didn't think so either. That's why I didn't pay the money. <laughs> no, no. It, and again, it's everyone's an individual. It's not just your body type. It's not just if you're an endomorph or an ectomorph or, an, or a mesomorph. And honestly, like the fasting differences or the macronutrient differences are like 5%. It's, it's like the smallest difference that they took. Even if you did your research and looked into it, it's the smallest amount of difference. Um, for intermittent fasting, though, I'll tell you that um, 
I would absolutely say not to just go right into eight hours because that's a big shock, not to your system, but to like your mind. And you have to know what's happening to be able to tell your body like, no, we're okay. We don't have to eat, you know, right now. So I usually tell people like, start on a 12 hour, pay attention, like see what you do. Um, do you start eating the second you get out of bed and then you don't stop eating until you go to bed? Why? You know, you don't need all that energy through the day. Let your body get the food, regulate your blood sugars, and then tell you when you're hungry again and then eat again, you know, like, so you really only need to eat three, maybe four times a day. Um, and I know, I'm sorry, grocery stores who are selling all that snack food that tells you you need a breakfast snack and a lunch snack and you need a snack after dinner and you need another snack. You know, it's not, you really don't need that much, that much energy that um, you think you do. Jane, this kind of brings us back to our talks um, before when we just talk, it's really all about mindfulness. It's all about mindful eating, paying attention to your body. And, um, you know, when it comes to sleep, when it comes to relaxation, when it comes to, you know, exercise, everything, it all comes down to just reintroducing yourself to your body again, um, instead of pushing through life and ignoring your, your own hunger cues and, you know, emotional eating and grazing and, um, you know, all of those things. I think one thing too, that, that I found, um, having people try just prolonging their fast from, you know, maybe the dinner the night before and when they eventually break their fast the next day. So say that 16 hours, maybe they're used to only eight hours, whatever it is, is you also get better in touch with your body's hunger cues. So you understand that, Hey, you know what? I don't have to eat right when I get up, I could push that off another four hours and I'm not going to die. You know, you can actually right. um, listen to what your body's telling you. And I think that gives you a little bit of better relationship with eating in general and it makes it easier down the line to understand, well, you know what, am I truly hungry? Does my body need fuel or is there something, some other underlying reason? Am I stress eating? It, you know, there's any number of those things too. So I think that could be a helpful tool just to try prolonging it longer than maybe what they're used to and just, just see how their body feels and understand that, hey, you know what? Um, maybe I'm not always this hungry. Maybe I don't need to eat as much as I do and kind of getting right. better it, in touch with their body's cues. It, it comes down to like a behavior. Like it's all, it's all a behavior. And some of the behaviors were taught to you and some of them you chose, but all of your eating behaviors, you should choose. You should choose those things. Um, and you know, if, if you're not, <laughs> the test for emotional eating, how you know the difference, because, because people don't, you know, I don't know. What does that mean? You know, or boredom eating or something. If you'd eat an apple, you're hungry. If you wouldn't, you're not. Because if you're looking for something very specific, like, nope, I want something crunchy. I want something can't, I want, I want chocolate. I want, you know, whatever it is, you're just eating for the fun of eating. You're not eating because you actually need that food or a hunger. For food. And like, I don't judge you, eat whatever you want. Um, whenever you want, but just know what you're doing. And, and it all, you know, it all goes together. Like you were saying, being, being mindfulness, Beth is like when you sleep and you sleep well, um, the hormones that come out, you know, leptin and ghrelin 100% have things to do with your hunger. It, it tells you if you're hungry or not. Um, and if you are in a constant state of I'm exhausted, you're always hungry your body's always like, go find sugar, find it, wake us up, do the things, get some caffeine, go, 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 go. And so then you live in this state of constant um, blood sugar spiking and blood sugar deregulation leads to all chronic diseases, stress, cortisol levels, like all of your hormones being off and blood sugar regulation has a lot to do with your hormones being off. Uh, it all leads to chronic disease. Um, so when you eat things that are simple carbs, like, uh, I don't know, bread, crackers, cookies, pasta, stuff like that, it has no fiber. That's what I, that's what a simple carb means. A simple carb is one that has no fiber. Um, it requires nothing to digest. So your, your stomach doesn't fill up. It doesn't send a hormone to your body to say stop eating or to your brain to say stop eating. 
Um, it just passes right through. That's why you can eat like an entire bag of tortilla chips and not even, not even blink. Like, how did that happen? What's going on here? Was um, that, it goes was right that throwing some people under the bus to do that you chose tortilla chips? <laughs> For me, it's m and <laughs> he's he's in the other room but it goes it goes right to your small intestine and it goes right into your bloodstream and boom you get a big sugar spike a spike or for example like let's say the standard american diet oh i had a bagel for breakfast all right blood sugar spike spike and then drop oh i need a cup of coffee i'm so tired blood sugar spike drop so you just ride this up down up down up down wave and then your pancreas has to like oh crap we need some insulin let's throw some insulin to and that constant overworking of your pancreas and insulin and, and all these things throw everything off um, off kilter. You get chronic headaches, you get, your cortisol level goes up, you don't drop weight. Like all the things come from eating simple carbs by themselves uh, and letting your blood sugar just ride this big roller coaster. So if you're gonna, when you break your fast, like in the morning, I think you and I were talking about this, Jay, before we, before we started recording, but a food that you could maybe maybe eat to break your fast. I tell my people to eat one of each each group. Have a protein, a vegetable, a fruit, have some fiber in there, get a little fat, have a nice hearty like breakfast. I always do two eggs with um, some sauteed veggies like peppers and spinach. Um, and then I'll, sometimes I'll do like cauliflower hash browns and avocado and, and I'm set. And then I'll have like a small bowl, uh, you know, a cup of berries on the side and my blood, like my body knows what to do with that. My stomach swells up. It tells my brain, all right, we're at max capacity. Stop, stop eating. Um, and then I'm fueled for several hours with, with something like that. So, so when you do eat and you do eat carbs, eat the complex carbs. So ones that have fiber in them, potatoes, um, fruits that, that have fiber, you know, that kind of stuff. Bean, beans have fiber, um, potatoes have fiber <clears throat> and try to avoid like the bread products that don't, um, the pastries, that kind of stuff in the morning, because all you get is that, that blood sugar rush. So eat something, um, from, from all of the groups. That's awesome. So thank you so much for all of this amazing information. I feel like you just gave us so much information to, to leap through. But um, so I want to do a really quick recap on, on intermittent fasting. And then um, uh, so so basically, you know, you're eating in a eight hour window. Yeah. You're fasting for for six, 16. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that right. <laughs> I had to do the math calculation in my brain, which wasn't easy. <laughs> So you're eating for eight hours. Um, obviously, you can eat whatever you want or whatever you choose, but but eating, you know, from the earth, eating the less processed, the better, eating from your food groups. And by food groups, I think uh, I know Tina and I agree, and I don't know what Jay feels his stance, but it's, you know, your healthy fats, um, your proteins, your veggies, your fruits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sticking to those main food groups um, during the day and being mindful, just listening to what your body's telling you. Are you hungry or are you stressed? And I love, love, love what you said. If you want to eat an apple, then you know you're hungry. If you're not going to eat the apple, then it's, it's some other form of eating, emotional eating of some kind. And boy, there's so much truth to that. Um, so let's, um, do you want to add anything else before we get, we get down and personal? Well, I just wanted to, uh, about intermittent fasting in the window of not eating, because that's where people are usually like, but what can I eat? But what can I eat when I'm not eating? What can I drink when I'm not eating? What can I, like, what, what does that mean? So a fasted state means just water or less than 50 calories in your fasted state. Anything above that will spike your blood sugar. It's all about the blood sugar spike. If you spike it, it's over. If you have the cup of coffee with a bunch of sugar in it, you're like, oh, it's no big deal. It's just a little coffee. Mm. Um, if it's got more than 50 calories in it, you spike your blood sugar, have your breakfast, move on next day. Like, no, it's fine. Next day. If you needed that, oh, I just, I'm going to have a terrible day. I know, you know, and you need it, then, then take it and move on. You don't have to intermittent fast every single day. But if you have the 50 calories in your fasting window, that fast is closed. You have now broken the fast, which means your body is now going to use the glucose that you're bringing in as energy 
instead of using its backup sources. You want it to use its backup sources um, so that you don't get an over accumulation of backup sources. Um, so that's kind of one of the things that I, I have people ask me a lot. Can I have tea? Can I have coffee? Yes, you can. If it's calorie free, um, black coffee, or if you, if you only use like one tablespoon of creamer that has 25 calories in it and two grams of sugar, yes, that's still okay. Um, but anything over 50 uh, throws you out of a fasted state. Great, great piece of advice. Um, love it. So let's talk a little bit about you. Who do you follow? Like Jay and I are big readers. We love to read um, and we have our, our people that we love to read. Um, a lot of these, uh, these wellness or talking wellness videos happen because we've read and were inspired by a certain topic. So who do you follow for inspiration and what books, what are the last couple books that you have read? Okay. Hmm. You already asked me this prior, I was supposed to have this lined up and I didn't. Okay. One of my favorite wellness books or nutrition books, uh, is how not to die. That's one of my jams. I don't know if you've ever read it. Um, Dr. Michael Greger. Is that Dr. Gregor that wrote yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and his premise is like a plant-based diet, you know, um, gets rid of cancer. Well, that's not, a hundred percent true. I mean, again, nutrition is an opinion and everyone has a different philosophy and he's allowed to have whatever philosophy he wants. But what I found is that people overestimate how many vegetables and fruits and fiber and stuff that they're eating, like the good stuff, the majority of their diet, they always overestimate and they underestimate how much garbage they eat or how many carbs and, and stuff like that. Um, and so I think the, what's interesting is that, okay, I do a lot of research. So I, I'm on Google Scholar. So I don't follow a specific person because again, it's all opinion. Um, I like to kind of be informed and, and um, form my own opinion. So I do, I do a lot on Google Scholar, uh, you know, searching for like new research, you know, the National Institute of Health, um, stuff like that, just for facts, because I don't always want someone's biased um, opinion, but I do like that book because I think it opens up the possibility to how much food actually does to your body. Like there are cancer, anti-cancer agents and antioxidants in blueberries and raw broccoli. Like those things do exist in nature. And it's like, we don't even know about it. If somebody says it to you, it's like, what? That's a thing? Yeah. So, so, you know, just kind of bringing that kind of stuff to light um, is great. However, I will say that the, the research behind a full vegan community, um, there isn't one uh, in any of the, any of the worldly cultures that have, um, that are vegan that hit all of their vitamin requirements. They, they're all deficient in something, you know, a, a vegan um, culture in Indonesia is missing, you know, um, vitamin B12, for example, uh, or they're missing zinc, you know, stuff like that, that you get in, uh, not zinc, I'm sorry, in iron, um, stuff that you get in, in meat that you don't. But um, I will say like vegan cultures usually tend to have a higher uh, vitamin ratio than standard American diets do. So it's not completely crazy, but it's also not necessary to be extreme on one side or the other, you know, like to be completely vegan or completely keto, it's, it's unnecessary to be an extreme. You can be in the middle um, and hit all of your um, micronutrient requirements. You really just eat your veggies. Yeah, uh, I, I think- For the love of God, right? Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think important to note is that um, for most people, you know, the typical North American diet, it doesn't take a whole lot to make it a little bit healthier. So if people right. are, are just kind of, you know, biasing a little bit more towards plant-based and whole foods, it's going to make a big difference. And the more you add those things, it tends to push out some of those uh, less than desirable things. Because really when it comes down to it, you know, we want to have a good balance so we're not malnourished and we're operating at, you know, highest energy levels and all those other things. So and anybody that has made profound changes in their diet and started to feel good, will understand that that's very, very true. So I guess maybe that's the good news if you're 
tend to follow the typical North American diet, you know, there's just little subtle changes you can make even on a meal by meal basis that could make a, a, a huge difference. And then you just go from there. Right. You know, you just take an awesome meal at a time. Oh, sorry. I'm, I was going to say, you just, you gave me an awesome tip and you said, just eat, eat veggies at every meal. And I've been even doing that with my son who's mm -hmm. eight. And now every meal, you know, before it might've been like a PB and J and um, chips or a PB and J and a, and a granola bar or something like that. But now it's like a PB and J and cucumbers or a PB and J and carrots. And it seems so simple but if you really become mindful of it, you realize how little you actually are eating or how little I'm serving to my mm -hmm. son. You know, dinner, always veggies. Veggies, always at dinner. Um, but veggies at breakfast, what? Like, I never thought about veggies at breakfast. So now, you know, I'm just throwing, like Jay said, one little stuff. I'm just throwing spinach in my omelet. Mm -hmm. Or I'm throwing, you know, um, a side salad, like just a small salad with my lunch. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's really made a huge difference in my world and how I feel and how my joints feel, um, you know, how my digestive system works and, you know, my moods, my sleep, everything. It's like a trick. Right. It's, it's all connected. And, you know, what helps me is like being educated about it to know, you know, like, how does that work? And so if you eat fiber, so veggies are the highest in fiber with the lowest other things like they have no cholesterol. Cholesterol is only in animal fat um, and animal products. Uh, and so, you know, veggies with the highest amount of fiber. And if you eat simple carbs, I'm not saying you can't ever eat simple. Don't eat them alone because then you get the blood sugar spike. Eating them with fiber requires your body to do a lot more work. It requires, you know, energy and, di and your digestion system to like kick in and, and get going. And so if you can eat a veggie every time you sit down to eat, you're setting yourself up for success and much better digestion. So if you're going to have a bagel, have your bagel, but throw some sauteed peppers and onions and spinach and make it like a breakfast sandwich, eat it together. You know, maybe, maybe take the top off of the bagel because that's a lot of carbs, but you know, just, just a half a one, but if, if you're going to have it, have it with other things, like eat salsa with your tortilla chips, you know, it's balanced. <laughs> all about you know, I, get that, I get that all the time. People are always asking me, it's breakfast, Jay. Why do you have that big bowl of vegetables or whatever? It's like, well, you know, if I wait till dinner, I'm not going to get the amount of vegetables I like to eat throughout the day so why not start right out of the shoot but I'm kind of used to that and I've been fortunate enough that's kind of how I was brought up but I realize that everybody thinks of a big bowl of veggies as breakfast it's more french toast the bagel yeah all those other things too and which the, by the way process I'm not saying that, you know yeah yeah it's just what makes me feel good but yeah I get that all the time right it start it starts your body out and you know there's another um just you know, real quick, another uh, kind of myth um, that I know went around like when I was younger, where I guess it wasn't a myth, it was kind of like just a behavior where you get this big salad at lunch. I had this huge salad. I ate this huge salad. I just, I'm full. I had this huge, okay, three cups of vegetables at one time is too much fiber for your body to even digest. So you put most of it out. You have to eat it at like different intervals of your day, like continually through your day to keep your digestion going. If you hit it all at one time with an atom bomb, then you know it, it, you don't get the same benefits. You don't get the time to absorb the nutrients from whatever was in your salad. You know, spinach you know has a has a lot of magnesium in it and vitamin K, and um, and so if if you eat three cups of that at one time, that's too much for your body to um, absorb. So spread it out during your day. Find a way that you like vegetables. If you know, when I talk to people, they're like, I just don't like vegetables. I'm like, well, you don't like how you prepare them because they don't taste like a whole lot. You know, they're not super, like Brussels sprouts, sure. But broccoli, cauliflower doesn't taste like a whole lot. So, you know, find a different way to prepare it. If you want to eat raw veggies at dinner, <gasps> eat them. <laughs> you know, that's it, there's all these rules that people don't even know that they have chosen for their lives that they have these rules where like, oh, I don't eat veggies at breakfast. I have a huge salad at dinner. And then I have to eat steamed gross broccoli at dinner. Like, no, you don't. You can make it however, however you want, change the rules. You know, uh, if you want to eat raw carrots at dinner, then live your life, girlfriend. You still got, still got that vitamin A and some fiber in there. It's fine with me. 
It doesn't have to be a steamed bag of carrots. <laughs> you know, roasting vegetables makes a huge difference for a lot of people's lives. When I tell them, like, throw, throw a little olive oil and garlic and put it in the oven and come back in a half an hour. It's, it's bomb.com. Um, and I have to laugh because it seems so simple, but we do. We create the craziest belief systems for ourselves and the craziest rules that we have to abide by. That's one of my practices in mindfulness is letting go of old belief systems because sometimes you're doing something and somebody says, why do you do that? And you're like, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know why I'm doing that. Right. So, yeah, so let it go. Let, let go of those old belief systems. So we are running out of time. So really quickly, I want you to tell us three fun facts about you. I'll talk to you about food all day. <laughs> that's one. <laughs> that's that's my passion. Um, I don't know. I already told you guys I was a Marine. Um, what's a fun fact? I don't know. I don't have any fun. Oh, oh, I'm a I'm a DJ. Um, extraordinaire like if we go to a party and i and the vibe is is wrong i immediately i'm like can i just can i just can i just can i just control everything please thank you very much can i just control the music um so i can vouch for that i have seen her at events where she's been on the dj stand and taken over <laughs> i mean that even even when i was younger when it used to be like club in time i would be up at the dj thing and be like can you play this next can you play this next? Can you, can you play this next? Because you're sucking at your lineup. Can I just help you? <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably my two like uh, funnest uh, facts. I don't really have anything else that's fun, I guess. Yeah, you have been in so well with us. Anytime we're together and we go out or whatever, even if it's just for a girl's night for dinner, we are not talking about anything but nutrition and exercise. Like that is it. We are like. What else is there? There is nothing else. That's what we're doing. We're such near such weakness when we talk. <laughs> exactly. Uh, 100%. We're always talking about, you know, oh, I saw this or or whatever about nutrition and, and fitness. Um, I, I guess, uh, I guess, yeah, it's been, how many years have we been doing that now, Beth? It's been quite a, a few couple? years. Uh, yeah, at least three or four, yeah. I can remember at, at least one, if not two, of our husband's, work at the same place and they, you know, have a big Christmas party every year and we get all dressed up and like ball gowns and fanciness. And it'll be me and Beth in the corner, like, oh my gosh, blah, 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 talking about nutrition and fitness and <laughs> just all these things. Everyone's at the bar, like getting schnockered and, and we're like, have you tried kale yet? Have you done it in your air fryer? Like it's... <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely been fun. So Tina, um, wrapping things up, tell us where um, where we can find you and how to connect with you if somebody would like further one-on-ones with you. Um, so it's really easy. I'm on social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram. It's the same. It's Fit But Not Fancy or um, just my name, Tina Durham. You can search and it'll come up with both. And then my email is also the same. It's fancy at gmail.com. If you uh, just you know, send me an email and say like, Hey, you know, I'm struggling with, let's say I have osteoporosis or I just got diagnosed with IBS. Um, I have the ability to walk you through like an elimination diet and, um, make recommendations for a meal plan that would be helpful, you know, good probiotics, stuff like that. Um, but I think there's really just a big disconnect in our healthcare system where you get a diagnosis and then you send you home with just like a copy paper printout and they're like, Here's how to eat if you have IBS. And then they have to go home and figure this all out for themselves. And so that's kind of where I come in. Uh, I'm kind of the bridge in between the gap to make things doable and and teach people the facts, not so much the, you know, the myths and things that are around this way of eating or that way of eating. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's how you get a hold of me. Thank you so much for joining us, Tina. Jay, do you want to talk anything about the Webster Rec? I know you guys just had an amazing pumpkin parade that was phenomenal. I witnessed oh, first yeah. event, but anything else going on you want to catch us up with? Um, no, we're just uh, continuing to roll out more rec programs. Um, keeping my fingers crossed, we're getting more people coming back to the fitness center here, more people participating in our classes. Um, your cherry yoga class on Friday is, is amazingly huge. So 
um, yeah, we're just keeping it going and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll stay open. Yeah, I love it. I love my, my Friday yogis. So my Friday yogis, we started out at the Webster rec center with eight people and it was eight people for like a year. And then all of a sudden there was 15 people and now there's at least 30. And um, I love it because they're like sneaking their friends in the back door and like they're all, they're all trying, they're all trying to get in. It's so much fun. I love them so much. They bring so much joy to my life. So Wellness 360, we just moved our Parkinson's program. We're still affiliated with GVPT, but we just moved our in-person Parkinson's program, the boxing um, down on Blossom to, I'm going to probably say it wrong, so forgive me, but it's Float and Sting, I believe. It's called Float and Sting. They have 18 bags hung six feet apart. They're following all COVID restrictions and guidelines, so it's so safe, and it's so um, it's so wonderful to see our, our community back together in boxing. Our online program is still going strong for those who don't feel comfortable coming into per in person. And then your Zoom is instructed by me right here from my living room. So if you have, or if you're interested in anything fitness or wellness, you can give um, us a call or a text. I always have the information for all three of us. Afterwards, if you stay tuned, all of the information of contact will be available to you. So until then, I hope you all have a fantastic day and we will talk to you all soon. Bye guys, thanks for having me.